Do you realize whether it's racism, abortion, gay marriage, transgender, all those issues are the same issue. Do you start your thinking with God's word or man's word? And really the answer to racism, it's the same as the answer to gay marriage, it's the same as the answer to abortion. The answer is the gospel. What I want to do is to show you today what happens when you start your thinking with God's word. See, this is not just a book about spiritual things, moral things, relationships. If we really understand the Bible, it is a book of history that is a revelation from God who knows everything. And so the only way we can be sure of having the right world view is to start with what God has revealed in his word and building our thinking on that. If there was one man and one woman, and if the Bible's history is correct, we're all descendants of one man and one woman, how many races are there biologically? There's only one race. It's called Adam's race. Do you realize we're all members of Adam's race? It's very important to understand because we take the gospel to every tribe and nation. Why? Because we're all one family. We're all one race. And it's very important to understand that. So when you hear people on television talking about the different races, you immediately should jump up and say, wait a minute, there's only one biological race, the human race, Adam's race. And actually, the, the, the interesting thing is, as I'll show you as we go on today, the secular scientists say biologically, genetically, there's only one race. And so when you hear people like uh, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson talking about the races and so on, actually the very terminology is fueling racism and goes against the truth of what we know scientifically about the human race. But before we can get into all of that, we have to do a couple of things. I want to answer one of the most asked questions first because the atheists say this all the time when you say, oh, there was Adam and Eve and then the Bible says Cain and Abel and Seth and so they will say, well, where did Cain get his wife? And actually, a lot of Christians don't even know how to answer that. This is an example of why we need to be teaching apologetics uh, to uh, our churches. And so what I want to show you is, look, when you take that history in God's word beginning in Genesis, it gives you a foundation for a right worldview to deal with issues like this. And we're going to deal with that practical issue today in regard to the origin of so-called races, racism, prejudice, and so on. And so to start with, we need to answer this question. Where did Cain get his wife? 1 Corinthians 15.45 says Adam was the first man. So how many men were there to start with? Just one. Okay, Eve was given that name, why? Because she was, in the Hebrew, it literally reads, to be the, the mother of all the living. And so there was one man, one woman. In fact, Acts 17, 26, when Paul's talking to the Greeks, he said, God made from one man of one blood, some translations say, all nations of men, for to dwell on the face of the earth. In other words, we all go back to Adam and Eve. I was in a restaurant in London a number of years ago, and the chefs heard that we were doing a conference nearby and that we believe the Bible. And he came over to our table and he said, you believe the Bible? I said, yeah, we believe the Bible. He said, I don't believe the Bible. I said, why not? Well, the Bible says God made Adam and Eve and they had Cain and Abel. Where do all the people come from then? I said, oh, Genesis 5, 4 says Adam had other sons and daughters. And he said, oh, I didn't read that far. So no, he didn't read that far. We don't read far enough. So the Bible says Adam and Eve had sons and daughters, right? Which means if there was only Adam and Eve, they had sons and daughters. And if the doctrine of marriage is one man for one woman, which it is based on the creation account in Genesis, then originally, originally, brothers must have married who? Sisters. See, as soon as you say that, then you have atheists and others saying, Oh, well, that's immoral. In fact, I had an atheist call me up on radio once and he said, I'm an atheist and if you believe brothers married sisters, that's immoral. First thing I said to him, so you're an atheist. You can't call me immoral. Because on what do you base your standards, right? You have no absolute basis for your standards. You can't call me immoral. But you see, I explained it like this. Look, God made Adam and Eve and they were perfect. So their genes were perfect. But Adam sinned, and you've got to understand sin and what it did to the world. Remember, if you eat of the tree, Adam, you will die. Our bodies run down and die. God doesn't hold everything together perfectly anymore. So, so we degenerate, and the older you get, the more you understand that, right? And so, because of sin and the curse, now there are mutations, there are mistakes. So when, you're, when your genes are copied from one generation to the next, there are now copying mistakes, mutations. Because it's a fallen world now. And then they add up for the next generation, and the next generation, and the next generation. 6,000 years later, here we are sitting in a room and it's full of mistakes. 
sorry about that. I can look around the room and see that just look, looking at you all. But here's the problem. If you're closely related today, it's more likely you've got similar mistakes, if you like. And so, so if a brother and sister were to marry today, they've got similar mistakes inherited from their parents. Then when you get fertilization and an egg is fertilized, then, and those mistakes get together and reinforce each other, you can have problems in the offspring. That's why it's better to marry someone further away in relationship from you. And so where you have a bad gene, so to speak, they have a good one that'll mask the bad gene. You get the idea? And so instead of having some deformity, maybe you might just have a crooked nose. You look in the mirror and see your nose is crooked and your chin's out of whack and your eyes aren't quite straight. See, those mistakes are all there, but they're masked, if you like, by, by good genes. Now, the further back in history you go, the less of a problem that is. Adam and Eve were perfect. Their genes were perfect. Their, their kids would have had few mistakes. And so close relatives marrying, provided it's one man for one woman, wasn't a problem originally, but it is a problem today. So if God made Adam and Eve, and we understand about Cain's wife and so on, but how do you get all the differences that we see in people today? I mean, even in this room today, there are differences in skin shade and eye shape and ear shape and, and, and so on. And there are distinctions. You can say, oh, well, this person is an Australian Aboriginal or this person is an American Indian or an Eskimo or a Fijian. How, how do those differences come about? How, how does that happen? And to understand this, we're going to have to do a little bit of what I call basic genetics. Sorry about that. There are people who say, I never studied genetics. If you got married and had kids, you studied genetics. So it, it's easy. And we're going to do some basic genetics. And then I also want to talk about skin color and, and issues like that to help you understand how this is all easily explained. For instance, dogs is an easy one. A lot of information on dogs. And so you've got lots of different species of dogs. But you can find documentation to show they're all connected. In other words, this species bred with that one, that one with that one, that one never bred with that one, but it bred with that one, that bred with that one, that bred with that one, that bred with that one. You get the idea? And so you can show, when we show they're all interconnected like that, we say, then they're all the one kind. And so our scientists did that and came up with, at the most, 1,400 kinds. It's overestimated because we would rather overestimate for the sake of argument. There are 34 species of dogs, they say. You've got your domestic breeds, for instance. You've got wolves, coyotes, jackal, fennet, fox, uh, dingoes. You've got all sorts of different uh, species of dogs. And here's what the secular world says. Based on genetic, morphological, and behavioral data, it's clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. So something like that gave rise to even these, right, and these. Actually. Do you realize poodles are considered the same species as a wolf, right? They're, do you see the difference there, by the way? And yet they're considered the same species. And you look at those and say, that doesn't even look like a dog uh, when you look at it. And I want you to understand something that's happening genetically here, because that speciation has nothing to do with evolution. Evolution requires brand new information that never existed added into the genes. What you actually see when you look at what's happening with different species and different breeds and so on is actually a loss of information till you get to the stage where there's not a great deal of information left, uh, as you can see, which is the poodle. The poodle is at the end of the line when it comes to <laughs> dogs, okay? Because if it lost any more information, it'd be gone. I mean, that'd be, that would be the end of it. Okay, so. How do we get our different breeds of dogs? Oh, here's a dog with a short nose, a dog with a short nose. Let's breed them together and get rid of any of the genes for long noses in dogs so we concentrate the short nose genes. You get the idea? And we've done that to get our domestic breeds of dogs. And by doing that, you eliminate variability and in information. But because of sin now, you're also concentrating mutations as well. So that's why if you have one of those purebred dogs, like a poodle or chihuahua or something, You'll know, you've got to take them to vets and spend millions of dollars to keep them alive. I want you to think about this, all right? If this is a poodle, if you breed a poodle with a poodle, can you get back to the original dogs? The answer is no. You don't have all the information there to do it. But if you start with the original dogs, could you, theoretically, get back to a poodle? You see, the answer is yes. Now, to help you understand, this is where it gets mind-blowing. Do you know how many atoms there are in the universe? They estimate atoms. You know how small an atom is? They estimate in the known universe there's 10 to the 80th power atoms. That's, that number is so big you can't even think about it. Do you know how much information is in our genes right now? 
Do you know if you took one man and one woman from this audience, how many children could you potentially have without having two with the same combination of information? It's that number. Compared to the number of atoms in the universe. Now, people, this is where, this is, see, our kids in the public schools don't, don't understand this, they don't get this. You start to realize God put that sort of variability, that genetic diversity, already in the dog kind, the elephant kind, the cat kind, the human kind. You get the idea? Two of each kind of land animal, seven pairs of some went on the ark and they come off the ark. And as they increase in number, they're not going to stay together. They're going to split up and move away from each other. And you'll end up with different combinations being dominant in different groups, depending on which mates with which, which survive, which bits of information get lost, which get combined with other. You get the idea? And you get different species. And they're told in the public school textbooks that's evolution. It has nothing to do with evolution. It's the opposite of evolution. What they call natural selection Adaptation resulting in speciation, here's what happens. Imagine those dogs go towards a cold climate. And in a cold climate, those with short hair, medium hair get cold. And they die. <laughs> and now you're left with dogs with L genes who, on their own, only produce dogs with what? L genes. Then you get those that go towards a hot climate. In a hot climate, those with long hair, medium hair overheat, and they die. And now you left dogs with only S genes, or on their own, only produce dogs with what? S genes. So what's new? Natural selection results in new combinations of already existing information, loss of information, conserving information for the present, no brand new information, the opposite of evolution. Natural selection is the opposite of evolution. And yet kids in our schools are taught natural selection is a part of evolution. See. You know, we've never seen matter produce one bit of information like you have in your DNA. And DNA also has the information for a language system to read the DNA. Matter can't produce a language system on its own. It never produces one bit of information on its own. But we've got zillions of bits of information. God placed all that genetic, genetic diversity there to start with. And so over time now, since the flood, you can get all these different species. Now... Look at the human race. I want to take the genetic principles here and say, OK, so when you look at the human race, we see Australian Aborigines, American Indians, Fijians, Hawaiians, Eskimos. How can we get distinct groups like that? Well, think about it in regard to dogs. You have to separate them out and isolate them from each other. Can you think of anything in human history that could have separated out people from each other and, and kept them isolated from each other? The Tower of Babel. It's very simple. God gave different languages, so what happens? Well, they, they, Genesis 10 says they moved away according to their language groups and their family groups, and there were certain basic language groups that moved away from each other, and they developed all the various ethnic groups or cultural groups that we see in the world today. And so we all go back to Noah and back to Adam, and all we're, all we're seeing, actually, is the working out of the genetic diversity God had already built into the humankind. When Darwin published his book in 1859, in The Origin of Species by Natural Selection, the rest of the title said, The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, that book was about animals. But at the end of the book, Darwin said this, In the distant future, light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. He intended to take what he had discussed in regard to animals, different breeds, natural selection, and he didn't understand genetics in his day, of course, and apply it to man, which he did 12 years later in his book, The Descent of Man. And in that book, The Descent of Man, it's very, very sad, but he actually fueled racism. Because if you do read it, you know what it says? At some future period, the civilized races of man will almost ex certainly exterminate and replace the savage races. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider then the Caucasians and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now between the Negro, Australian Aborigine and the gorilla. Do you, know, do you realize what Darwin's saying? The Australian Aborigines and people from Africa are closer to apes than what he calls the Caucasians. How's that for racism? You see, I'm going to challenge us that as God's people, we need to get rid of the word races. See, I believe the church should be leading the way in dealing with racism and prejudice. And if God's people really believed his word and really understood the history in Genesis, we would be doing just that. And the reason I say let's get rid of the word racist, because years ago the word racist has changed meaning. 
The word races used to mean an ethnic group, different cultural group. But because of the influence of evolution, now races means lower races, higher races, primitive, advanced. And that's why I challenge us to get rid of the word races. In fact, I suggest we use a term more like people groups. Ethnic groups, cultural groups, I like people groups. You know what's interesting? Secular scientists know that this is so. For instance, Journal of Counseling Development, 1998, evidence continues to collect that the term race is meaningless used to point out differences in people that are not definitive. In the year 2000, it was announced to the world, it was headlines in newspapers all across the world, that the Human Genome Project, that was headed by an atheist actually, Dr. Venter, but they did observational science, study of genetics, they put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome and unanimously declared there's only one race, the human race. Wow, who would have thought of that? Do you know what the church should have said? Told you, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve, the Bible's history is right. But see, because so many of our Christian leaders adopted evolutionary ideas and, and didn't teach the book of Genesis, you know what? Most people in my churches don't know what to do with that issue. We don't have a real Christian worldview in regard to this issue because we haven't built our thinking on the history right there in the first 11 chapters. And this one here, the American biology teacher, 2011. Here is the biological problem with race. The genetic variation within each of the various ethnic groups of Homo sapiens is greater than that between the various ethnic groups. You know what they're now saying? What will once decide to separate races the variation, the genetic diversity, variation within each group is greater than that between the groups. Which means what? The whole concept of race is meaningless. You know, it's interesting in response to the Human Genome Project in the New York Times and quoting a professor of molecular genetics, the criteria that people use for race are based entirely on external features we are programmed to recognize. And people in the culture in America People are programmed particularly to look at skin color, what they call black and white. And what I'm going to help us understand here is that there are no black people, there are no white people. We all have a main pigment in our skin, just like when you go to the, to the store and you say, I want to buy a brown paint. I want a dark brown, a light brown, really dark brown, middle brown. We have a pigment called melanin. It's a couple of different forms of melanin. There's a few other pigments, but the main pigment is melanin. And there's quite a number of genes involved, but again, just the basic principles to help us understand. If big A and big B represent a lot of the pigment, little A and little B a little bit, then if you had all big A's and big B's, you'd have very dark skin. Little A's and little B's, very light skin. In the middle, big A, little A, big B, little B, you'd be middle brown. The majority of the world's population are middle brown. If you get skin shade, not color, because we're all the same color, so we shouldn't talk about what color you are, it's what shade you are. If you group people in the world, you find it's that bell curve with middle brown right in the middle, because that's the majority. At the bottom of the epidermis, there's these special cells called melanocytes. They're here, and they have these little tentacle things here. And in them, there are special little organelles called melanosomes that produce packages of melanin, that pigment. And these little tentacles will take that uh, pigment up here into your skin. And your genetics will determine whether you produce a lot of melanin or not as much melanin. And when you go out into the sun and tan, you will produce melanin to tan to a maximum that your genetics allows. And it's important to have melanin because it protects you from ultraviolet radiation. See, we need to redo our terminology. We should talk about shade, not color. People groups, not races. All are colored, not just some. So when people say, there's a group of colored people, I've got news for you. This whole room is a group of colored people because if you're not a colored person, you have a problem. Right? You want the color. You need that pigment. And everyone's related to everyone else. It makes a big difference when, when you see someone, if someone you don't like, and you say, but they're my relative. Right? Maybe it'll make you pray for them. Because if you say, I'm praying for my lost relatives, there's billions of them. So, question. What shade, not what color, was Adam and Eve's skin? If Adam and Eve had all little A's and little B's, the whole world would be that. But if Adam and Eve had all big A's and big B's, the whole world would be that. But that lacks the genetic variability we see. It makes much more sense that Adam and Eve are in the middle, middle brown, and from two middle brown people, you can get people who are lighter than the parents, people who are darker than the parents. That's very, very easy to understand. There's lots of families like that. You go to Florida, California, you see a lot of families like that. Kids darker than the parents and lighter than the parents. And see, that's why you can end up with instances like this, where you have, and these are from Australia, actually, 
uh, and they're probably much bigger than that now. And uh, these from um, mainly United Kingdom. Uh, but there's lots of examples of twins like that. And you see, because of the Tower of Babel, if some people in some groups, because of who married who, who died out, who was left, who was isolated from who, if they ended up with only big A's and big B's on their own, they're only going to produce dark-skinned people. If they ended up with only little A's and little B's on their own, they're only going to produce light-skinned people. Remember, poodles with poodles only give poodles, right? These would have to mix back with others to get back the genetic diversity that was already there to not have just light skin anymore, but to produce people with different shades. It's the same for eye shape. One of the major factors in eye shape is the amount of fat in your eyelid, but again, eyelid, but again it's just part of that um, genet genetic diversity we have and the, and the lit, tiny part of our genome that reflects the differences in the outside. And so, as ABC News said in 1998, what the facts show is there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. And actually, the answer to racism is this. Do you realize whether it's racism, abortion, gay marriage, transgender, all those issues are the same issue? Do you start your thinking with God's word or man's word? And really, the answer to racism, it's the same as the answer to gay marriage, it's the same as the answer to abortion, the answer is the gospel. To see people saved, one to the Lord Jesus Christ, who then build their thinking on the Bible to have a worldview that is Christian. That is the answer to racism. Biological fact, all humans belong to one race. Spiritual fact, all humans are divided into two races. What is the difference between the two spiritual races? The direction in which they are racing. Because there's the broad way, which is the world, and the narrow way within the broad way, running in the, the other direction. And so I want to challenge us. We tend to look on the outside and think there are major differences. We've got to stop doing that. We're programmed to do that. We've got to start understanding in humans, the outside reflects a tiny part of our, of our genetic diversity. And you see, a good example to me to understand this and, and to make application is when Samuel went to anoint the king, 1 Samuel 16. And we know Samuel didn't know it was going to be David. And he met one, one of David's brothers. And you can imagine, put it in a modern vernacular, wow, look at this guy, tall, muscly, football star at the school, intelligent, he's obviously going to be the king. Remember what happened? The Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him for the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. You know, it's interesting. Evolutionists look on the outward appearance of short hair, long hair, big beaks, little beaks, but you look on the inside of the genetics and you realize, wait a minute, that's not evolution. We tend to look on the outside. Oh, look, black, white, whatever. Wait a minute, they're just minor variations and, 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 and shade and so on. You know what we should be doing? Thinking about the heart. See, think about it. Someone comes to your church, has a different skin shade to you, or eye shape, or earlobe shape, or whatever it is. We, we need to train ourselves not to even look at differences on the outside, but to think about the person. Does that person need the Lord? And you know... Even when it comes to marriage and dating and stuff like that, think, think about a, a Christian girl who says, oh, look at that guy at school. You know, he's the football star and he's, he's strong. And, well, I wish he'd take me out. Wait a minute, young lady. Does he love the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his mind? Because it is not the outside that matters. It is the inside. Or imagine a Christian guy and he looks at this girl. Oh, she's so pretty. Got just the right amount of melanin I like. Wow, I, I'd like to go out with her. You know what, young man? Does she love the Lord with all her heart, all her soul, all her mind? Because it's not the outside that matters, it's the inside. And, and I have a message for the guys that's very important. Remember this, the outside changes with time. Look at the mother and you'll understand exactly what I... Now I'm in trouble, aren't I? But you know what? If you fall in love with the outside, you can fall out of love. But if you choose to love the inside and make that commitment before the Lord. 
And I can say that my wife and I love each other more than we ever have. Do you realize, think about this for a moment, we talked about poodles, mutants, dog species, kinds, animals on the ark, Cain's wife, skin shade, racism, prejudice, marriage, dating, all in the same talk. How can you do that? Do you realize how exciting it is? People, when we believe that history in Genesis, which is the geological, biological, astronomical, anthropological history that so many Christians have ignored and so many churches have never taught from, and you understand that's the foundation for all of our doctrine, the foundation for our worldview, then you know why you believe what you do, and you know how to answer questions and defend the Christian faith.